afternoon and welcome to our next in the series of free webinars from Language Nut. This afternoon's webinar is a, another section of looking at Ofsted and we are doing our surviving and even thriving in a primary MFL deep. And we're really grateful this afternoon to have um, our primary specialist who herself has just undergone a deep dive in languages, um, Eleanor Chettle-Cully, who is um, going to speak to us this evening about her experiences of a primary deep dive in her school and also look at some of the things that you might look for in your own school in terms of what um, an, a deep dive might look like uh, and also based on the current framework what kind of things you may be asked uh, and some answers that you might give to some of the questions which you may be asked and also how you might prepare for a primary MFL deep dive. So if you can introduce yourselves in the chat, say um, where you are, whether you're a language specialist or whether it's something that you do as part of your role in school and tell us where you are, where you are based in the UK. Um, that would be great if you can pop that into the chat and then we can see who's attending this evening. Um, if you have any questions, please put those in the chat as well. Uh, we're going to be starting in just over a minute's time. We're just waiting for everybody to arrive because I'm sure you've all been dashing from your lessons at the end of the day and also maybe just trying to grab a cup of tea, visit the loo, which we don't get a chance to do much these days with the <laughs> frenetic uh, day that we're faced with, particularly at this time of year when lots of things are happening in primary. Um, so just to reiterate then, this afternoon, this is the second of our Ofsted um, sessions um, on surviving and even thriving in a, a deep dive and this afternoon we are really grateful to uh, Ellie Chettle Cudley who is joining us as a, an MFL specialist in her school from her school which has just had a deep dive a few weeks ago and Ellie is going to be sharing some of her experiences with us this evening in particular around what a, might, a deep dive might look like in your school, um, how you might prepare for a deep dive and also some of the questions which you may be asked and some of the things which you might say in relation to languages in your own setting. Um, so if you can pop in the chat who you are, whether you're a linguist, uh, a language specialist or whether it's your role in school and where you are actually from, that would be great. I can see we've got some from Stockport, from Leicester, from London, from Hampshire. We're all over the place. That's absolutely great. Welcome to everyone um, this afternoon. OK, so I'm now going to hand over to Ellie, who is going to put on the next slide, Ellie, if you wouldn't mind. Mm -hmm. um, just to talk a little bit about my experience, I've uh, those of you that have attended some of the webinars before know that I've been working with Language Not Now um, for just under a year and I was working for a big uh, multi academy trust um, within primary and secondary um, with languages and obviously Ellie, would you like to, I'll introduce Ellie, uh, over to you Ellie. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ellie, uh, I am a primary trained uh, teacher um, but I also have a degree in French and Hispanic studies and um, after working for many, many years in year six mostly, um, I'm now working as languages and international lead at Hazel Community Primary School, which is in Leicester. Um, and I think we have some people from Leicester here today, so uh, nice to have local people as well as all of you guys from further afield. Um, I do um, a lot of work with teachers and um, a lot of work with student teachers at the University of Leicester on um, sort of upskilling people in the delivery of primary um, languages. And I also run the Association for Language Learning Leicester Primary Hub, um, which is another kind of um, centre for upskilling teachers in the delivery of primary MFL. Um, I blog and I tweet about languages and um, I've just, as Elaine said, um, experienced and survived, luckily, um, an Ofsted deep dive into languages. So today's session uh, really aims to do the following, um, to consider the focus of the new Ofsted framework. And I say uh, new here uh, because, of course, it's been around for a while uh, now, but with all the lockdowns and things, it just doesn't feel quite as long. Um, and we're going to be unpicking what we mean by intent implementation and impact, which are what, uh, how the quality of education in the school is going to be judged with regards to languages. We're going to familiar, familiarise ourselves with the possible procedures for an offset deep dive. 
and consider the documents that we may want to have prepared uh, and the way in which we might want to present evidence of planning and progression to inspectors. And we're going to explore the sorts of questions we could be asked and how we might uh, respond to them. And hopefully by the end of it, you're going to feel uh, more confident when facing the possibility of a deep dive into languages at your school. Now I've put um, possible and may and might, I've used all of those modal verbs because these are things that could happen. They are possibilities. Uh, my experience is one experience. Um, it's not necessarily going to be the same for everybody, um, but this is just a general idea of what may happen in your school if Ofsted do, uh, do arrive to do a deep dive into languages. Um, Elaine, I'm just going to pass back to you for a moment to have a quick chat about the Ofsted uh, review. Thank you, Ellie. And Ellie is absolutely right. There is absolutely no one way to actually prepare for a deep dive. It depends very much upon your inspectors. I just wanted to quickly uh, refer you to the OSTA curriculum research review that was published on the 7th of June 2021. If you go onto the OSTED website and search for OSTED curriculum research review MFL, you'll find it there. And that is a document which is, uh, is both uh, for primary and secondary. And it contains very specifically at the end of each of the sections, the high quality language education may have the following features, not should have. And I think it's really important to refer him back to what Elias has just said. Everything that we do on this webinar this evening is what you may or might do. It is not what you have to do or should do. It's what you may or might do in your own scenario. OK, thank you, Ellie. I'll pass you back to you for the main part of the webinar. Lovely, thank you very much. So we're going to start off by thinking about um, what we would expect children in key stage two to be learning in languages. Now, for some of you, this is going to be very much familiar territory. So just forgive me for recapping um, very briefly on this. So um, we know that all maintained schools in the UK are expected to study, or in England and Wales, should I say, to study the basic curriculum, um, which includes uh, the national curriculum, religious education and sex education. So of course, MFL is now a statutory part of the national curriculum uh, at key stage two. Um, academies, which aren't of course maintained uh, by local authorities, are expected to offer all pupils a broad and balanced curriculum that should be similar in breadth and ambition to that offered by the national curriculum. So um, essentially um, academies have to teach languages as well. They don't have a get out of jail free card uh, and they would, expect it to be, would be expected to be teaching languages as well um, if Ofsted arrived. Uh, teaching may be of any modern or ancient language and should focus on enabling pupils to make substantial progress in one language. And I think it's really important um, that this is stated in the languages programme of study because we want to be seeing children making progress in one language rather than doing one language in year three and four and then another in year five and six, for example. So we want to be seeing that sustained progress over the four years of study at key stage two. The building blocks of language according to the, T uh, the languages programme of study and also um, according to the document recently published by, Ops, uh, by uh, the DfE, which is teaching a broad and balanced curriculum for educational recovery. The three blocks of language, building blocks of language are phonology, grammatical structures and vocabulary. And it's on this that all of our teaching should be built. Uh, there's no specific statutory amount of time that we should be teaching languages for. Um, in most cases, you're usually looking in a primary school at between 30 and 60 minutes a week. Um, we say that best practice is around 60 minutes, but that doesn't have to be all in one block. So it might be that you have a 30 to 40 minute lesson um, and then you have revision sessions throughout the week. So taking the register in French or Spanish or German or um, doing a little uh, revision activity here and there. Um, obviously, that's best practice and that doesn't always happen, but really children should be accessing about 60 minutes um, a week, ideally, which really isn't that much if we think about it. Um, and since there are a variety of ways um, that schools can um, construct their languages curriculum and teach their languages curriculum, there is, of course, no one single way of achieving a high quality languages education, um, as Elaine's already mentioned um, in the Ofsted research review for languages. So there isn't one specific way. I'm going to show you some of the things that we do at my school, but um, you will, of course, have your own ways of doing things and um, your own documentation, etc. So this is just um, some exemplification really for you during this session. 
for some reason. Why is that not moving? Ah, there we go. OK, so the current primary languages landscape, and I'm sure a lot of this won't come as news to many of you, is that um, up until uh, quite recently, the main focus of uh, primary schools really was preparing children for their statutory assessments in reading, writing and maths, which happen obviously at the end of key stage one and key stage two. And uh, there was a little bit of concern Ofsted, I think that um, there was a little bit too much focus on data. So the deep dive uh, element was introduced to the inspection, which was aimed at assessing to what extent a school is offering a broad and balanced curriculum. And we've all heard this phrase so many times now, broad and balanced. Um, so now when Ofsted come, they're going to start taking deep dives into subjects. Uh, into subject areas, um, which could include, of course, um, languages or any other aspect of the curriculum outside of um, reading, writing and maths. Although, of course, reading, writing and maths may still be a focus, particularly reading. So between October 2019 and March 2020, Ofsted carried out 24 languages subject inspections in primary schools, which were judged to be outstanding under the previous framework. Um, and there's a really interesting blog on this by Mark, Michael Wardle, who's the Chief Inspector for Languages, um, at, the, uh, at the link on the page. But the findings, which, um, as I've said, I don't think will come as a surprise to many of us, were that there was a lot of variation in quality in terms of languages teaching, with some schools barely out of the starting blocks in terms of teaching languages, which is a little bit worrying given how long languages have been statutory in primary schools for now. Um, the review also found that schools were not focusing on the building blocks of language learning, so they weren't focusing on phonics, grammar and vocabulary, and instead they were just focusing on increasing pupils' stock of words. Um, there was also a belief that children didn't need to be writing in the target language, so there wasn't much focus on writing in some places, and assessment was very limited. There was very underdeveloped transition arrangements, which means that pupils who may have studied a language at primary school may have gone up to secondary school and sort of, sort of started again because there wasn't any uh, transition arrangements in place. And that in the best cases, um, many primary schools, because of the um, difficulties in terms of timetabling, in terms of actually getting time to fit languages in, in the best cases, um, many schools were doing more with less which is much, much better than trying to cram in lots and lots and lots. So there was um, less content, but um, that content was actually being embedded really well and children were actually learning and remembering more. So it's really interesting that in these schools that were considered to be outstanding under the previous framework, um, languages was really not being taught in many cases particularly uh, particularly well at all. And of course, that is going to be something that has changed now because uh, inspectors are coming to look individually at, at subjects. Now, we should all be fairly familiar with the programme of study for languages, which is really, as language teachers in primary schools, our main document that we need to be looking at and referring back to all the time. It consists essentially of these 12 statements, and these 12 statements are all the things that we should expect children to be able to do by the time they leave primary school, so by the time they leave year six. <coughs> Excuse me. So the children are going to be able to do all of these 12 things, apparently, by the time they leave, um, including this last section, which um, the grammar section, which is um, really, really full and has lots and lots of um, key information in about what children should be doing in grammar, including understanding things like masculine and feminine, um, looking at high frequency verbs, etc. Now, the problem is, of course, with this for us as as primary practitioners is that this tells us where we need to get our children to by the end of year six, but it doesn't tell us how we're supposed to get them there. And if you think about the documentation, those of us who remember that was there um, pre um, the new uh, iteration of the curriculum, um, there was a lot more guidance there for us as primary, as primary languages teachers and primary languages leads. And all of that's been taken away and we're just left with these 12 statements. So what we need to do is we need to look at ways in which we can break that down, because, of course, we can't demonstrate progression over time if we don't break down those 12 targets, because those targets are very broad and they're not broken down into stages or milestones for us, which makes it very difficult to demonstrate progression over time because we can't show when and how particular targets were met. And we know in order to um, demonstrate progression that targets must be met repeatedly and at different levels of challenge to really demonstrate progress over time. 
So without these marker points provided along the way, we need to break down each of those 12 targets to ensure that we can demonstrate progression. And meeting a point of attainment on the scheme of work isn't the same as demonstrating progression over time. So the main thing that you really need to be asking yourselves to start off with is does your scheme of work break down the programme of study into the smaller steps that you need to demonstrate progression? And how do you know? And if you already have a scheme of work that's been bought in, then hopefully that should do that a little bit for you, although you may want to uh, cross check it with um, some of the resources that I'm going to suggest uh, as we go through. Um, because you really do need to be sure that if and when Ofsted do arrive, that you're able to explain to them how you are, how you're making sure that your children are making progress. And if you haven't been able to do that yet, there's a really useful um, set of progression resources on the Cave Languages website in the sharing best practice section, which actually breaks down those 12 targets of the uh, programme of study and allows you to see what a child in year three should be doing as compared to a child in year five, uh, four, five and six. So if you haven't had a chance to do anything in terms of looking at progression yet, that might be a really good place to start. And there is uh, several different types of document there that will show you how to do that. So when we're judging the quality or when Ofsted are uh, judging the quality of education within a school, they're really now going to be focusing on three uh, areas. They're going to be focusing on the intent, the implementation and the impact. So the intent um, really is the remit of senior and subject leaders, and it basically uh, asks us what are we intending for our pupils to learn? How have we designed and sequenced our curriculum in order that children learn uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that allows them to progress over time? And is the curriculum ambitious and is it appropriately designed for all pupils? So th that means do SEND pupils, for example, access their language learning? How are we pushing those children who are more able and who grasp things a lot more rapidly? And this is a really important point to make because very often in, in primary schools in particular, languages are sort of seen as, as a nice additional thing that children do. And actually quite often your SEND pupils might end up being taken out for extra reading, extra writing, extra maths and may miss out. So when you're thinking about the intent of your curriculum, you really need to be thinking, is everybody included? That's really important. When we think about implementation, we're, of course, um, thinking about um, subject leads and teachers. How do we go about delivering the curriculum? What are we actually doing uh, when we're in the classroom that allows us to deliver that curriculum to the children? Uh, that's really important. And then the impact. Uh, which is what uh, inspectors see in pupils and in their work and links, of course, to the previous two sections. Um, can pupils remember what they've learnt? Can they apply their learning in different situations? And how can we be sure that the children have learnt anything? How do we know what they are learning? How do we assess that, uh, that learning? So those are the three areas that, um, that, that Ofsted are going to be focusing on. And um, it may be that... Um, Sorry, one second. It may be that you have created some sort of document uh, already that kind of breaks that down. And if you haven't, um, I'm not suggesting that you do this necessarily for Ofsted, but you might want to think about uh, sort of breaking this down into some kind of document, which is going to allow you to um, to kind of really clarify your thinking, if you like. So let's have a, a little think about what intent means um, for us and what should we be thinking about? What questions should we be asking ourselves in terms of the intent of, of our curriculum? Why are we teaching languages? That's really important. Why are we teaching our children Spanish or French or German? Is it for pleasure? Is it to liberate them from insularity, which uh, is what is mentioned in the programme of study? Is it to equip our children to become lifelong language learners? Is it giving children skills for future travel and work? All of those things are really important and we need to think about why are we actually teaching them languages? And what are our overall aims for pupils when they're learning languages? And this, again, is really important. Is it so that they're ready for secondary? Um, is it so that they become good language learners? So, for example, if they are learning French at primary school and they go on to secondary school and study Spanish, do they still have the skills that they might need, the transferable skills that allow them to be good language learners? For example, are they able to use a bilingual dictionary? Do they understand cognates and near cognates? That sort of thing. Um, do, they, do we want them to have a good grounding in phonics, vocabulary, vocabulary and grammar? Probably yes. Um, 
do we want them to understand French and Spanish and German in a global context? So not just thinking about French as being a language spoken in France, but also um, a language spoken in many, many parts of Africa and many other parts of the world as well. Spanish as a, as a language spoken in South and Central America, for example. Um, can they confidently manipulate language for their own purposes? Are we trying to raise aspiration? In a school like mine, raising aspirations is a really big thing. Languages are a huge part of that, showing children what they could do, what they could achieve, where they could go to with languages. Are we increase, aiming to increase their resilience? Because of course, languages are hard, they're tough, they make mistakes um, and they'll need resilience to be good language learners. Or are we aiming to foster a love of language learning? These are things that, uh, all of these things are things that I am aiming to do in my setting. Um, so really, when you sit down and think about your intent, these are questions that you need to be asking yourself. Why am I doing this? Because you will be asked by Ofsted, what is the intent of your curriculum? What do you want your children to learn? What do you want them to know? And you need to be able to communicate that really clearly. And also we need to be thinking about how the curriculum is designed to meet the needs of our particular school community. Ofsted have been very clear about this, that we need to be able to adapt our curriculum to suit our setting. So this is why, again, in this webinar, we're saying this is what it might look like, what it could look like, because, um, again, each school community is so different and needs uh, such different things. So when we're thinking about implementation, we're thinking about what we're doing on the ground to ensure good languages provision. So we're thinking about who teaches languages, how often and for how long. So what's actually going on in terms of timetabling? Has the scheme been written or has it been brought in? And if it's been brought in, has it been adapted for the needs of the pupils in your school community? So it's not going to fit, one scheme of work is not going to fit every single learning context in this country. We need to make sure that we are adapting. How do we ensure progression? given the vagueness of the programme of study. It may be if you have a bought in scheme of work, there's some kind of documentation in there already. Have you made sure that that's fit for purpose? Have you checked that progression really carefully? If languages are taught by non-specialists, how are they supported to deliver quality first teaching? So what are what CPD is available to them to make sure that they're feeling confident? We know that in primary schools, so many teachers teaching languages are not specialists and they may not feel very confident in delivering languages. And it's one of the reasons why languages often get pushed off the end of the timetable, because if people don't feel really confident in teaching, they may uh, they may decide against doing so. Do all pupils attend lessons? Again, going back to our SEND uh, chat earlier, is everybody accessing language lessons? How are you addressing catch up post lockdowns? Um, are reading, writing, speaking and listening all covered and given equal weighting? That's something that you might want to think about really carefully. Is your scheme of work built on the foundations of phonics and vocabulary and grammar? What sorts of activities do pupils do in lessons? So breaking down exactly what pupils are doing during lessons. Um, what support and stretch is there for SEND pupils and rapid graspers? Um, are there retrieval practice uh, uh, opportunities and opportunities to revisit built into the scheme of work? So these are questions that you need to be asking yourself with regards to your scheme of work. Um, what enrichment activities do you have? So think about trips and themed days that you might have. We always celebrate, for example, uh, Le 14 Juillet in school because we teach French. Um, we always celebrate Bastille Day. We have um, art, Francophone Art Week. We have La Semaine de la Francophonie. So we have particular weeks where children are actually learning through the medium of French, but also in a cross-curricular way. Thinking about your partner schools. Do you have partner schools or do you have links in local universities? And do you offer any extracurricular languages as well? All of this is part of your implementation. And it's really important that you're clear on what your implementation is. And as I've said, if you haven't written any of this kind of thing down, it can be a really helpful way of clarifying and organising your own thinking. Because the better you, the more you've thought about this, the better able you will be to answer any questions that are put to you on this subject. And of course, impact. How do we know that pupils are learning what we want them to learn? So do, how do we use formative assessment and how does that um, reflect uh, an impact on our future planning? How do we use summative assessment? Are we using summative assessment and how do we evidence work in books? So these questions, if you haven't thought about them already, might be really helpful things to go back and think about so that you can create some kind of um, intent, implementation and impact document that very clearly expresses all of this information for you, for senior leaders, for Ofsted and for anybody else who might want to look at it. And don't forget, you don't need to have all of this straight away. 
but you should know where your areas for development are so that as and when officer do arrive, uh, you can discuss those with them. They're not expecting everything to be perfect, but they will expect you to have a plan if you've identified an area where you need uh, where you need to make some improvements, for example. So that's kind of unpicking uh, those three areas, uh, intent, implementation and impact. So let's have a quick think about the possible structure of what a deep dive might look like. Now, it's going to look different in different settings because all of us will have slightly different ways of teaching MFL. Some of us are going to have specialist teachers. Some of us are going to have a member of staff potentially who goes around and teaches and who's got slightly higher level of qualification than, than most other members of staff. Or we might have class teachers teaching. So we're going to have slightly different, um, slightly different deep dives depending on what our our situation is. But for everybody, um, the the inspection will start with what's called with the pre-inspection, the call, if you like, where um, the head teacher and members of SLT will sit down uh, on the phone with the inspectors, the lead, the lead inspector, and discuss which areas are going to be uh, selected for the deep dive. Now, Ofsted will already have an idea of some areas. They will come and look at reading. Um, they will probably have an area, another area um, of the curriculum that they have in mind. So, for example, for us, it was maths because that was identified as an area for improvement in the previous inspection. Um, but then the head, <coughs> excuse me, the head can then decide to guide Ofsted, if you like, in the direction of particular subjects that they feel are, are a particular strength of the school or where they would like Ofsted to look. Um, so when the inspectors do arrive the next day, they will uh, want to be meeting with various uh, different people. They'll meet with um, senior leaders to talk about the general overview of the curriculum. Uh, and they will then also want to meet with curriculum leaders to look at the long and the medium term plans and to discuss the way in which that, uh, that subject is taught within the school. Now that curriculum leader uh, might be, in my case, also the subject specialist. So I am leading the curriculum, but I'm leading myself essentially because I teach uh, all of the French to all of Key Stage 2. Um, so uh, it was kind of, that could be the situation for some of you. Or it might be that the curriculum, the curriculum lead is um, coordinating a variety of different class teachers who are all teaching their subject independently in class. Then there's, there will be at some point, not necessarily in this order, but at some point there will be a lesson visit or lesson visits. For me, it was just one lesson visit, but it may be more than one lesson visit in which the inspector will come and look at lesson or lessons and have a look at the learning that's going on and see how that fits in with what they've already been told by curriculum leads about what is actually happening in school. So if they've had a look at the long term plan and it says that you're teaching uh, about birthdays in year four, then when they go to the lesson, they should expect the children to be learning something uh, to uh, to uh, to do with uh, teaching them about their birthdays in the in the lesson. Uh, they will also conduct at some point um, work scrutinies um, in which they will look at work alongside uh, pupils as well, or they may look at work independently of pupils as well. So in my case, uh, we had a look at books prior to the lesson observation and the inspector wanted to look at a variety of different books, uh, particularly with a focus on SEND pupils and pupil premium pupils um, who uh, I wanted to see their books and wanted to discuss with me the books and have a look at how uh, match the books up with what I'd said the children were doing in the curriculum at that time. So the work scrutiny may or may not be with pupils initially. It may well just be with the um, with the curriculum lead. There'll also be interviews with teachers if uh, if you're in a school where the teachers are teaching their own MFL. Um, so they will be discussing again with teachers um, the various different aspects of, of teaching languages, how that what planning they're using, how they know that, that children are progressing, uh, etc., and how they're sequencing the curriculum. So teachers, if there isn't a specialist in the school, teachers need to be aware of why it is they are following the scheme of work in that particular order, and they need to understand the scheme of work and how it uh, how it progresses over time. So teachers will need to be able to articulate that as well as the curriculum lead. And there will also be um, interviews with pupils. 
The pupils will be taken from observed lessons, apparently, but in some cases I've also heard of pupils being taken randomly from classes as well, um, but most likely to be from, uh, from observed lessons. And the um, inspector will talk through uh, the learning from the lesson with the pupils and most likely uh, the pupils will bring their books with them and discuss that learning. Uh, with the inspector as well. And we'll have a look at um, some possible questions that the children might be asked. And the reason why they're talking to so many different people and looking at so many different things and so many different aspect, aspects is, of course, to triangulate their findings. So make sure that what the curriculum lead is telling them is the same as what is actually happening in lessons and that the pupils are aware of what's happening in lessons and that the pupils are learning and remembering more. So it's a much more focused um, and much more... Um, uh, shall we say, detailed um, look at subjects than, uh, than was happening previously. Now, the key thing to remember, of course, is that you're being judged um, against the inspection framework and uh, the national curriculum. So those really are the most important documents that you need to be looking at. And we've already mentioned both of those uh, during this session. So if we just go into a little bit more detail, the discussion with the um, lead or the subject specialist um, is uh, is really important. But remember, as we've already said, there is no Ofsted favoured way of doing things and there's no one type of pedagogy. So there is no one way to deliver MFL in primary schools. Everybody can be doing it differently and everybody can be doing it well. What the um, uh, inspectors will be looking for is that that particular way of doing things is well suited to your setting and that everybody's singing off the same hymn sheet, if you like. Observed lessons, uh, as I've said, will uh, the model will depend, of course, on the delivery, um, who's delivering lessons. Um, but essentially, um, if you are a subject lead and you are um, you will be going to observe teachers in lessons, you will be sitting in with the inspector and you will be you will need to be able to discuss what you can see. You'll be able to you'll need to be able to discuss what's going on in that classroom and why um, and also how you're supporting those teachers with the delivery of MFL. Um, of course, if you're a subject specialist, you will just be observed by the inspector on their own. Obviously, make sure your rooms are nice and tidy. That goes without saying. And think about your displays and how those are supporting pupil learning. So making sure that they're really focused and actually supporting what the children are learning in class. And of course, there will be no feedback from lesson observation. So those of us who were inspected under previous frameworks um, you used to trot along to the office and wait outside and then the inspector would call you in and give you feedback. Um, that's not going to happen anymore. You, um, you may find out how your lessons went um, from your head or from your deputy who are allowed to listen in to feedback between the inspectors, um, but you won't have any feedback directly. Um, when you're thinking about pupils in lessons, of course, um, just think carefully about where your spare seats are, who, who uh, inspectors are going to be sitting next to. Um, but of course, they're going to wander freely and they could ask any child about their learning at all. Um, post lesson discussions with teachers who've been observed. Um, as we've already mentioned, teachers need to be able to articulate how and why they are teaching languages and make sure that their CPD is up to date. And uh, post lesson uh, discussions for, with inspectors with pupils, um, they will or they may choose the children themselves or you may be able to choose the children. I was able to choose the children in my case um, and because I knew that he was very interested in SEND children and pupil premium, I made sure that those pupils uh, were represented within the group that he wanted to talk to. Um, and the children will obviously need to bring their books with them, but more on that in a moment. So um, don't worry too much, however, on, on the children being picked out by inspectors, because um, I know from uh, other people that I know who've had deep dives and also um, within my own school, if the inspectors choose the pupils and those pupils aren't necessarily able to articulate in the way that we might want them to, um, then they can be and will be swapped out by the inspectors for other children. So um, there's definitely not a sense that they're trying to um, to catch you out, if you like. They want the children to be able to give the information that, that they need to collect for their evidence. So um, my suggestion, um, just coming from my own experience, really, would be to, before um, Ofsted arrived, potentially to consider conducting some pupil voice interviews in advance or pupil interviews in advance. Um, I didn't get a chance to do this and the children were absolutely brilliant, um, but they were very, very nervous. And I think it would have taken away some of their nerves if perhaps they would potentially had an opportunity to articulate some of this sort of information 
previously. Um, so just asking pupils how they remember things in languages, what are we learning, why are we learning it and how are we learning it? Those kinds of questions are the sorts of things they're going to be asked and um, it would be really helpful for you to know whether pupils are able to articulate that sort of information already. So do pupils know where they've come from and where they're going, for example? Do they know how to use their knowledge organisers? So if they have knowledge organisers in their books, which many of us use now, um, which has sort of trickled in from secondary a little bit, do children know how to use them? Because that was certainly a focus for um, our inspection. Um, he was very interested in the, in the knowledge organisers. He was very pleased that the knowledge organisers were in books, but he kept asking the children, so how do you use your knowledge organiser? Um, when do you use your knowledge organiser then? What does your knowledge organiser tell you? So um, from my experience, I would definitely make sure that the children are aware of how to use them. Um, again, uh, I, we've mentioned this already, but think about the types of children that you choose. Make sure that it's not all just your higher ability high flyers because they do want to see a range of children potentially. Uh, they may ask you for that, um, but it's also nice and it makes it look like you really know your children if you're able to produce a kind of a nice mixed group for them. And as I've already said, it definitely didn't feel from my experience like the inspector was trying to catch the children out. He was definitely asking them questions that led them to the answers that he wanted them to give, which was really helpful. It didn't feel like he was um, sort of trying to trick them into giving answers or give away anything particularly. So that was that was really positive. So in terms of um, allowing children to know where they're going, um, this uh, language learning journey on the left is a really lovely one, which is really detailed. And I um, stole from Elaine, actually, the, uh, Elaine's uh, previous presentation, really brilliant um, secondary uh, example um, of uh, showing children where they're starting from and where they're going on their language learning journey. And I love how detailed it is without being too uh, two in your face. My example is the one on the right and this is what I use but I'm thinking that I'm going to just add maybe a little bit more detail on mine to, um, to explain what it is that the children are doing in each unit because it tells um, the children and the inspector where they're going uh, with their units of work but doesn't actually tell them what each unit of work includes so I could definitely um, add a little bit more detail onto that I think but this was something that the inspector picked up on that the children had this in their books so they were able to say oh you know we're going to do a topic on sport um, in a in a you know uh, after Christmas or whatever. So this was nice, uh, a nice way to kind of help the children to feel more confident in articulating where they were actually going and what units of work they'd already covered. So again, thinking about the pupil interviews, because I think this is the part that I was most nervous about because it was sort of a part that was kind of beyond my control, really. Um, and these are just some of the questions that uh, the children in my school were asked. Um, what are you learning during French? Uh, what were you learning during your French lesson today? Can you tell me something that you learned in the lesson? Um, the children were um, learning about months of the year in order to be able to articulate um, their birthdays. They'd already done numbers, um, and they were starting to put all of this together into into phrases, into longer phrases to say when their birthday was. So there was a prompt in there. He was saying, you know, can you say June in French? Can you say July in French, etc. So just to check on their learning. How do you know you're doing well in French? Does your knowledge organiser help you when you're learning? Do you enjoy your learning in French? What kinds of things do you like doing in French? What kinds of things did you learn last year? This was a really tricky question, but he did acknowledge that the children, uh, to the children that there had been a lockdown and that makes it harder to remember things. So he did sort of um, try to put them at ease with that. Would you like to carry on learning French when you leave school? And, which I thought was um, quite an odd question really, would you feel confident to speak to a French person if you went to France? Um, and a load of them said, yes, I'd be really confident to do that, which was great. But I thought, gosh, that's, that really takes a lot of courage, you know, to feel like you could confidently talk to a French person if you went to France. And of course, there are some other possibilities listed there, which I'm not going to go through um, in full detail, um, but I'm sure that you will probably get a copy of the slides potentially. Elaine, I'm not sure if that's the case. Yes, Elaine's nodding. So you can always have a look through those questions as well. So there's some possibilities for questions there. Um, we also had, as I've mentioned, a book scrutiny, which we've talked about. Um, my book scrutiny was sort of in two halves because we had a book scrutiny 
after our general chat in which he wanted to look at basically books from year three, year four, year five and year six and cross check them with what I said um, we were doing in terms of the long term and medium term planning. Um, and he also did a little book scrutiny with the children as well in terms of talking about what they were learning. But however the book scrutiny looks for you and um, really my main suggestions would be have all of your books marked up to date. I mean, that's fairly obvious, isn't it? And have pupils respond to their marking. That can be really tricky, of course, because we um, we don't always uh, have lots of time to do that. But if possible, we could uh, if we could try and do that. Don't forget that there is not an expectation for pupils to be writing in books every week, and you need to make that clear to inspectors as well. They may not be language specialists, but they should know that there are four skill areas: um, reading, speaking, listening, reading, and writing. Writing is just one quarter of the skills that we need to be teaching so there doesn't need to be writing in books every single lesson. I made sure that all of my books were available to the inspector so I basically had a room set aside all the books were there so that he could just pick from them as he wanted or ask me to pick from them and also it meant that I didn't have to keep running back and forth between classrooms to go and get different books so everything was there and again I think it just gives the impression that you don't have anything to hide if you've got everything there they can look at anything. Make sure that you've got examples of SEND pupil and pupil premium books to hand and that you know who, who those pupils are. Obviously, if you're a specialist teaching all of those classes, you may well be able to pick those children out automatically. But if you're the lead and you don't know all of those children, it's really helpful for you to post it note those books probably so that you're able to pick them out really easily under the pressure. Um, again, as I've said, explain that there won't be writing in every lesson. If you're using photos, sorry, I've just noticed a typo there, make sure that they are annotated. So photos are great and they give children a reminder of what they've done in particular lessons, but they don't always tell us that much about the learning that's been happening. So what I tend to do if I'm using photos in the books is I will use post-it notes, and I'll write on those post-it notes any observations that I've made. So, um, I don't know, little Jimmy um, pronounced all of the new fruit words really beautifully using his knowledge of phonics or whatever. Slap that in the book and then um, I know that when I look at that photo, it actually has a context. Or you could also ask the children to write post-it notes after the lesson, which explains something that they've learned in that lesson and put those on the pictures as well so that uh, there's a context for them. And of course, you could use QR codes as well if you're using video so that you can um, so that you can help the um, if anybody wants to look at what they've actually been doing, they can scan and see a clip of what the children are doing if they're learning a poem or singing a song, for example. Um, I would uh, point out any differentiated activities that you have in there, so make that really clear. Um, I would explain really clearly where each of the lessons fits. If they're looking at it lesson by lesson, where does that fit into the process? Are there examples of all four skill areas? And do you have evidence of phonics somewhere? It might not be specific activities, but it may be, again, written on your post-it notes that they've used their phonic knowledge for something. So make sure that that's really clear. Remember that these people who come to inspect may not be language specialists. Um, so it's really nice to point out some of the specifics of, um, of language teaching and learning to them so that they're aware of that. Um, and you may also want the following documents to hand uh, the Languages Programme of Study, as we've said, um, an intent implementation and impact document, um, which uh, we've already discussed. Some of us may have already written. Um, you don't have to write one, but it can, as I said, be uh, really helpful in kind of helping to um, clarify your own thinking. The school languages policy your action plan, a subject lead if you have one, your long-term plans, uh, your long-term plans by year group. So what I tend to do is break down my long-term plans into more detailed uh, plans, which are sort of colour coded with um, red for new learning and uh, blue for revisited learning. So it's really easy to see um, what's going on there. Weekly plans, uh, your progression documents and your tracking data if you have it. Um, they may not ask to see tracking data, um, most likely they won't ask to see tracking data, um, so don't panic too much, but it is nice to have it there. So we're going to have a look at intent to start off with and some of the questions that we may be asked in regards to intent. Um, again, these are some of the questions that I was asked in my experience. And then there are some other possibilities as well. And the bullet points that I've put here again are just to help to get you thinking about how you might answer these questions. These are not perfect answers, they're not um, exemplification, but they are there to help you to get your thoughts uh, in place about what you might what you might be asked and how you might answer. 
So what do you want children to be able to do in French at your school? So I kind of clarified this with him and said, do you mean by the end of year six? And he said, yes, what do you want children to leave primary being able to do? And for me, it was being able to confidently speak and listen and read and write in French so that they're ready for secondary and have a really good grasp of grammatical concepts and key vocabulary and phonics. So really thinking about those key building blocks and to have a range of skills as language learners, which we've already mentioned, um, which will put them in good stead when they go to secondary. So thinking about um, use of bilingual dictionaries, um, using cognates, near cognates, etc. To have a really good understanding of French as a global language, um, not just one that's spoken in France, and to feel, feel that they love language learning and to set them on the path to be lifelong language learners. So those were the things that I really wanted my children to be able to do, but you might have other things in there that you would like to add to that. And other iterations of that question might be, what language skills do you want the children to be proficient in? So thinking specifically about the skills that you want them to be able to have, and what body of knowledge in Spanish or French or German is it that you want the children to retain at the end of their time at your school? And you might talk um, specifically about um, the specific grammar, uh, things that you want them to know, gender of nouns, plurals, etc. Um, high frequency language, conjugation of high frequency verbs, etc. So those are just some ideas about some of the things that you might want to present to um, Ofsted in terms of um, in terms of your intent. We also had to think about progression um, and I gave an example of my detailed um, long term plan. And I'm just going to see if I can just um, share that um, very quickly. Um, Elaine, if you can just give me, um, I don't know if that's sharing. Is that sharing at the moment? It should have a long term plan up there. Um, it's not. No, it's not. OK, let me see. Uh, how can I share? I don't know if Zoe can support there at the back. Sorry. All right. Yeah, um, it might be that you need to um, stop sharing and share again. How do I stop sharing and share again? Sorry. Oh, stop sharing. Yeah, got it. Right. I'm just going to share again. Um, lovely. OK, lovely. Thank you very much. Um, so this was my um, this is my detailed long term plan that I discussed already um, and I went through this with him and went through all year groups with him. Um, this is just an example of year three, for example. Um, but what I've done is I've broken down each unit. So we've got our year three units, we've got our unit overview. But what um, I think was really helpful for me in terms of discussing with him was that um, grammar coverage was um, broken down really um, really clearly. So any new learning was in red um, and anything um, revisiting was in blue. So he was able to see very clearly where the new grammatical concepts were and where um, where the revisiting was. Um, I made sure that phonics coverage was there. Vocabulary, again, we've got lots of red because the children are in year three. They're learning lots of new vocabulary that they've not met before, but there were also opportunities for um, revision and revisiting. So again, that was really clear for him that um, that there was um, that there was a new learning and revisiting learning. And then I also linked in authentic Francophone culture, literature, so books that we were reading and songs as well. And so having a document like this was really helpful because I've devised my own scheme of work. Um, it was able to be really easy for me to show him um, where progression was happening in between year groups and where revisiting, etc., was happening so that the children were coming back uh, again to um, to old learning and having a chance to revisit that. OK, so that was something that um, that I did spend time looking at, looking at with him. Um, so I talked him through that and talk me through a unit of work and tell me why you're doing it at that point in the year. So I spoke to him about why I was doing a particular unit at a particular time and other possibilities, of course, what is the sticky knowledge that you want children to retain? And if we want your uh, knowledge to be re uh, retained, the children have to emotionally engage with it. It needs to be hands on. It needs to be practical, relevant, social, so children can share what they've learned and it needs to be uh, introduced in new and interesting ways. So when we're thinking about knowledge, uh, we, a sticky knowledge, we need to think about those things as well. And what do you use? Uh, uh, what scheme do you use and why was it chosen? This is going to be really helpful if you have a bought in scheme of work. Really, really useful. In terms of the implementation, um, how do you make sure children can revisit their learning? So that was something that I was able to show quite clearly through my planning. Um, 
and also we talked a lot about starter activities you know are we we're using starter activities to revisit learning and um, we also talked a little bit about how we use French around the school so for example in registers and um, we always sing joyeux anniversaire to our birthday children in birthday assembly on Wednesday for example um, we talked a lot about SEND pupils and how we supported those at school we have um, a no ceilings approach to um, setting tasks for SEND learners um, we don't give um, specific tasks, or I don't in French, don't give specific tasks all the time to SEND pupils. I tend to try and make things a little bit more, um, little bit more open than that. Um, so what I like to do and how I also like to push the more able is to use things like um, this kind of uh, speaking and uh, writing grid, which I did share with the inspector. And that's another thing I would say, definitely take examples of your resources to exemplify what you're doing. So in this case, for example, the children are talking about um, what they can see using Ausbrun, brown bear. So um, the children might very well just create um, a red sentence verbally or in writing, je vois un cheval, for example and they might be happy with that, but they could push themselves onto the orange section, je vois un cheval violet, for example, so that would be extending them even further. And then they might push onto the green section even and use a conjunction to add an extra chunk of information at the end. So these kinds of resources for me are really, really helpful because they um, enable children, even SEND pupils, to push themselves as far as they feel confident and comfortable to do. And um, the inspector was really pleased to see that there was this kind of no ceilings approach um, in languages and across the school generally. And I did make sure to point out that actually supporting SEND pupils, we do a lot of things very naturally when we are teaching languages. We use a lot of images to um, reinforce new vocabulary. We do um, a lot of singing. We do a lot of um, physical activities and physical actions to support particular vocabulary. Um, and in school, we also use physical French phonics when when we're teaching phonics which attaches an image and an action to a sound so again helping to embed that learning and when we were talking about pushing the more able we talked about the writing and speaking frames that I've shown um, and also talking about how uh, more able children can model and lead on elements of learning including in our school how they lead on on the revision activities between lessons other possibilities, of course, how do, ensure, how do you ensure clear and reliable pronunciation? And this is where you need to be really clear on what you're doing in terms of your phonics. So you may use a standalone course in phonics. So, for example, the physical French phonics that I've uh, mentioned already. Um, maybe you don't overcorrect um, and you give lots of experience of listening whilst reading text and using transcripts, etc. Um, how do you ensure you cater for cultural capital? So thinking about how you bring in the cultural elements of learning um, and what are the main issues in MFL in your school? What's the biggest barriers to learning, for example? So that's going to be very personal to your setting. Um, in our setting, we don't have that many barriers, actually, because although we have um, lots and lots of um, children who come to us from abroad and speak another language, that's actually a really um, amazing starting point for many of our linguists. And our children already have a really good understanding of um, of why it's important to learn another language. In some schools, that's not going to be the case. And how are you addressing gaps in learning created by COVID? Now, we know that language learning is very sequential, like maths, and if we build on very unsure foundations, we're going to create gaps. So we need to make sure that we're very clear on how we're adapting our units of work to ensure missed learning from previous years is incorporated. Uh, retrieval practice is very important in that, but also it may be that particular units need moving from certain year groups, for now, because they've not been covered previously and they do need covering, um, or uh, units might need adapting. So it's not going to be enough potentially to say, well, we're just following on with the scheme of work because there are going to be gaps. How are you filling them? And in terms of thinking about impact, um, questions like how do you assess whether pupils have retained what you taught them? That was a question that I got asked um, and we were um, thinking a lot about assessing learning throughout lessons and how I jot down observations on post-it notes and put those into books, as we've already mentioned, and how I use summative assessments at the end of each unit where children are assessed very, very briefly and in a really low stakes way on their speaking, listening, reading and writing. Um, and I talked about my tracking grids and how I use those to inform future planning, although he didn't want to see those. And um, you might also want to mention uh, the kinds of assessment that you use that are linked with your particular scheme of work. You may use the Language Magician, which is an online tool which assesses children's uh, language learning in year five and year six. 
which you may be familiar with. Uh, and another question potentially, what diagnostic assessments do you use and why? So you need to be able to express the meaning and the reason uh, behind those assessment assessments. Um, is it so that you can report back to parents, for example? Uh, does it inform your future planning? Hopefully it does. Um, so those sorts of things are questions that you're going to need to consider as well uh, before being asked them by an Ofsted inspector. And you're also going to be asked, I'm going to keep this really brief because we're coming up to five minutes before the uh, end and we probably need time for questions as well. Um, how are you looking to develop MFL in the school in the future? So thinking about your leadership. Um, and for me, in my school, that was really thinking about how, because it's me that's teaching languages, the school, uh, the class teachers don't really get that much chance to engage with the French learning of their children. So now we're thinking about how we can introduce revision activities, which are set up uh, by me in terms of videos, but which the teachers can then run in class um, with the help of the gifted and talented children as a way to um, allow children to revisit their learning throughout the week, but also to give teachers more confidence in potentially being able to deliver um, MFL. And we're currently also working towards the lingual mark accreditation, which helps us in that sense to um, really analyse and, and find um, our steps, our future steps, if you like, uh, in terms of improvement for MFL. Um, but of course, um, if you're leading on MFL and your class teachers are are non-specialists, you might be asked on about the CPD that staff have had um, and how you support uh, new teachers or non-specialist teachers or less confident teachers in your role as lead and how you monitor your subject over the school as a whole if it's not you that's teaching it all the time. So are you using pupil voice? Are you using book scrutiny? Are you using lesson observations? And what's on your action plan this year and what are your key areas for development? And that will, of course, depend on your setting. So those, uh, that is a very sort of um, hopefully um, not too um, scary overview of some of the questions that you might be asked. Um, and now I think maybe we can go over to um, some questions for me, if there are any questions in the chat at all. Yeah, thank you very much, Ellie, for that very clear, personal and very thorough uh, run through of what a deep dive might look like in a primary setting. Um, do we have any questions? Zoe, who is our head of content, is at the, uh, in behind the scenes today with us. Um, do we have any questions that anybody has asked? Yeah, yes, we do. I have a question from Amanda Doyle. And um, again, if anyone's got any questions, please add them now while we're while we're doing these. Um, but Amanda Doyle has asked um, if we could have potentially a copy of your detailed planning so they could adapt it for their own schemes. Are you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's absolutely yeah, that's fine. That's I'll just send it to Elaine and then um, yeah. maybe send that on. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah perfect. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we was everyone's very generous with with their resources. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah and, and anything I'm sure that we can, uh, if you contact uh, Elaine's Elaine's um, email address is there. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also this webinar is being recorded as well, so we will get that sent round as soon as we can. Um, it just takes us a few days to get everything.